This is the new Spinnaker Flutes dive watch. It has great vintage cues. Just look at that bezel. One of the things I love is the automatic movement. Check out that sweeping seconds hand. I mean, what's his hand on a sec? Yeah, check out that sweeping seconds. Oh. Hey guys, I'm here at my uh, local coffee shop to let you know that unfortunately, this watch, this uh, Spinnaker, is broken. And rather than just ignore it uh, on my channel and just not, not post about it the way that um, in the past I've, I've just wanted to do polish, finish reviews and not give a lot of commentary or inside process on what I'm doing here. I thought it would take a moment to talk about that and talk about some other kind of interesting uh, related industry type, industry type issues that I think are um, you know, significant or, or you know, maybe of interest uh, to my community uh, as a community of collectors and, and people who are interested in what's going on in the industry. So the way that I thought that we could approach this is talking a little bit about coffee actually uh, and uh, how my perspective on the coffee industry actually relates a little bit to the gear industry. Now you might be aware of the fact that coffee has gone through sort of three major phases in the industry in uh, the 20th and 21st century. Um, they call them the three waves of coffee. Now the first wave was the uh, so-called Folgers era of coffee when um, coffee became uh, mass marketed and uh, brought into the home uh, at a large scale, um, kind of industrially produced coffee. In the second wave of coffee, there was basically the rise of boutique marketing. There's um, storefronts and things that make coffee a little bit fancier and the quality has definitely gotten better as well. But the idea is, is that coffee became more of a desired product rather than just another food commodity and, uh, and the experience of coffee was something that people sought after uh, as part of the coffee drinking experience. Third wave coffee, the latest phase of the coffee industry is really about full disclosure within the industry, sourcing of coffee beans, the manufacturing process, but really uh, it also is about creating an even more elite boutique market. And so if I was at an Intelligentsia, for example, um, which has some of the best coffee I've ever had, um, or any number of uh, small but very serious coffee markets, what you would be um, looking for is just a full transparency in the whole manufacturing process of coffee, you know, from the plant to the cup or whatever they say. Okay, so what does this have to do with watches? Well, I think that the watch industry has some analogous ways in which the industry has evolved in uh, the last uh, 50 years or so. Uh, I would say that what we saw with the quartz revolution was sort of equivalent to the, um, uh, the proliferation of Folgers type coffee in the house where all of a sudden everyone can afford a watch and it's cheap and widely available, you just go to your local store and get it. Um, the Swiss watch industry and, and actually the Japanese watch industry pushed back and what you saw was uh, a renewed interest in uh, more boutique type timepieces uh, so that you uh, now can go to your average jewelry store um, and find decent mechanical Seikos. Uh, at least I, I can locally do that. And, um, and there was a rise in uh, boutiques and an attempt to control boutiques in a new way, especially with um, big brands so like Rolex uh, became more exclusive. Omega has been slowly walking up uh, the exclusivity ladder, as it were, and is doing what they can to uh, create a, a consumer experience that is more upscale. And then finally with third wave coffee you have something like um, what we have with Spinnaker watches um, or a lot of the microbrew watches on the market um, and also some higher end brands as well and, and this is certainly happening in Hout Horology so I don't want to oversimplify things but you're having a more full disclosure and a more viral attempt to explain the watchmaking process. So these boutique watches are usually more forthright about you know where specifically components are being made, where they're being sourced from, um, and uh, what's going into the design of uh, these watches. You're not going to find Rolex talking on Instagram about uh, different design options, but you will find that for sure with brands like Halios um, and uh, a lot of the other small boutique brands where they're trying to create a fan base that's much more intimately connected with um, 
the whole process and not just the manufactured product. So big watch companies like Rolex and Omega have a much more dedicated marketing dimension to their products and the way that they're trying to sell their products is by uh, really trying to make them uh, from the eyes of the consumer an object of desire and uh, and idealizing those products in the ads and so that's why you always have you know the classic Rolex as referring to watches um, you know uh, being worn on um, you know Mount Everest or in uh, you know when you're spelunking or something with the Explorer 2 and of course the Submariner is you know has this incredible uh, provenance with Omega of course you've got the moon watch um, and uh, and there's some merit to that of course because those watches actually Actually, were part of those accomplishments, uh, and that's a, I mean, a, a hell of a selling point for sure. The, the disadvantage is that you have somewhat a lack of transparency uh, in some of the aspects of the watchmaking process, um, because if they were totally forthright about where everything was coming from, uh, it might, in the eyes of the consumer, devalue the products. Um, and that's one thing that, in particular, Swatch has really gotten a lot of uh, heat for, because especially their lower-level or mid-tier Swatch brands like Hamilton or Tissot, these brands are outsourcing parts a lot, and that means that um, you might have uh, some pieces originally from China, and then uh, only a certain percentage of the parts are actually made in Switzerland to meet the quote-unquote Swiss-made label. These are all issues that are well known. Similarly, uh, brands like Spinnaker or um, other microbrew brands that are very forthright about their designs and are eager to put these products in the hands of consumers, and so you see a lot of like viral marketing, which is um, why I was sent this watch is I'm um, you know a person that can draw interest to the brand essentially just because of my own enthusiasm and, and my own platform obviously these smaller brand watches are coming in at a much lower price than what you'd be seeing some of these big brands coming in for uh, and so it's bringing value to the consumer if the products are good um, the disadvantage is, is that uh, a guy like me or any number of uh, reviewers are easily put in a position to kind of hide uh, problems that they might find in the things that they're sending for review. I mean, it's sort of uh, is not an incentive for a company to send you something if you're going to report on all the problems that are going on uh, with the watch. And you know, a lot of times these products are good enough that there aren't problems to report, and so I can get a product in for review and I can just give a good endorsement for it. Other times, as you know, on this channel, I've had to report that there are real problems with the products that I've reviewed. Um, you know, my AV8 bronze uh, pilot watch that I reviewed a couple years ago is a great example of that. At any rate, I just want to be forthright about when I'm getting a product in for review and when there are problems with it. I think Spinnaker is going to try to make this situation right with this watch that they sent in for review. Uh, they said they're going to send me some packaging and I'll, I'll, they'll send it back and check out what's wrong with it. I was just using it normally and it quit working. Uh, it has a Seiko NH35 movement so it's not like there's a movement in there that's garbage or something. Something. It's definitely some problem on their end though, not on my end. So I'm just trying to be more forthright about that kind of thing. You know, my reflection on Basel World and sort of the, the direction that a lot of the watch community takes with big industry events like that is um, there's a lot of BS. There's a lot of um, speculation and, and uh, you know, it's just bullshit basically. I mean, what happens is, is people are commenting on watches that they've never seen or have never had a chance to use or wear. And, uh, there's not something necessarily wrong with that, actually. Uh, I encourage you to read uh, Harry J. Frankfurt's um, small essay called On Bullshit, and what he talks about is that bullshitting is part of our world. We, we uh, inevitably have a certain degree of uh, BS that happens, and, uh, and sometimes you know, just speculating on new pieces or commenting on what uh, watches stand out to us uh, or that look good are, are worthwhile. Um, I just think that as a collector you need to be aware of uh, your agency in that kind of conversation which is of course they're viewing you as a potential consumer and, uh, and in addition to being an enthusiast and so when you're you know, seeing glowing excited first looks at Basel World watches something like that has a uh, dimension to it that views you as a consumer and not just as an enthusiast. I've been watching all those videos like everyone else. They're not my favorite to make, especially for myself, because I'm not there. I'm not able to really give any commentary that uh, I think is particularly insightful. Um, uh, if you're wondering, I think that uh, Tudor's line was definitely the most interesting line of Basel World 2018. I love the new Black Bay 58. The GMT looks absolutely amazing. It looks like a lot of fun. It's a true GMT. Um, Omega was very disappointing to me. Rolex is just out of reach for me at this point. 
Um, so is uh, Patek, even though I love the idea of getting a perpetual calendar and a sports watch. Uh, that kind of talk coming from me is fun, but I hope you understand that you can probably develop those opinions in two minutes yourself, just looking at the press releases from these companies. So I don't want to make it a focus on this channel, or uh, at least for now it isn't going to be a focus on the channel. Anyway, I just thought it was kind of interesting to talk about you know, the distinction between second wave watch industry and third wave watch industry and some of the pitfalls that can um, be present in either kind of mode of marketing and presenting these products. And, and my position as a gear reviewer and kind of as a, an influencer in the community is uh, I want to be transparent, um, but I also uh, want to support new products that I'm excited about. And so there's a balance there to be found in uh, taking risks and bringing new stuff to the table and, and also being forthright when things aren't working out. So I, I expect Spinnaker will work things out. Um, but for now, I have a broken watch from them and I'm waiting to get an envelope in the mail from them letting me ship it back to them so they can fix it. Why don't you let me know in the comments below what kind of transparency you'd like to see in gear reviews here on YouTube. What other comments do you have maybe about the state of the watch industry? I'd love to hear about it. And make sure to hit that subscribe button if you're new here. Thanks a lot.